I'm Joel Bradkey, and I was Pilgrim's Delegate to the 2019 Wells Biennial Convention. I want to thank the congregation for sending me and uh, charging me with the responsibility of representing it and uh, taking in all that is involved with the church convention. As I reflect on the four days there, the opening worship service stands out in my mind. As you enter the Chapel of the Christ on the Martin Luther College campus, the first thing you see is the baptismal font. It's quite large and, and modern and angular, and yet it has eight sides, the traditional form for a baptismal font. The eight sides represent Noah and his family, eight people who the Lord saved through water. And I think about all of the people that get baptized and are, have their faith kindled through this washing so it is a very uh, powerful symbol as you enter the chapel. The music was terrific, but when you're at, on the site where so many Wells musicians are trained, you would kind of expect that. The hymns were chosen as part of the content of the new hymnal that is in production. Now, I'm a kind of an older person who resists change sometimes, but I was really pleased because these new hymns were quite singable and you could really concentrate on them. And so I, uh, I will certainly withhold judgment until the Advent season of 2021 when the new hymnal is to be introduced. One of the scripture readings was from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. In the third chapter of that letter, Paul prays for the Ephesians. He reminds them that it is the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that strengthens them in their faith. And he challenges them to grasp the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of God's amazing love and power for them. This was a powerful message. And it was brought to my attention by the preacher, Pastor Jonathan Bauer of Good News Lutheran Church in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin. And I'd like to briefly read from his message. Pastor Bauer says, as we think about the work we do as a synod, it's easy to see a much smaller picture than Paul does. And as a result, be filled with worry rather than confidence that Paul had. My hope is that the time we spend in these words gives us a sense of calm confidence as we remember Christ's church will never die or fall. And I say, well spoken, Pastor Bauer. As we prepared for the Lord's Supper and sang the liturgy, the Sanctus, Holy, 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 and the Agnus Dei, Lamb of God, I noted that those portions of our worship were uh, provided by uh, the musical talents of Kermit Moldenauer, a professor of music at MLC. 
about four years ago, my wife Carol and I got to visit Pat, Professor Moldenauer at his office at the college. He has since retired and he is finding time to en enjoy his grandchildren. But I marveled at the fact that his gift to the church in an important liturgical fashion lived, lives beyond his retirement and that we are gifted by that. Nearly 700 people received the Lord's Supper. And I was struck by the fact that we had come from so many different locations, even other parts of the world, to be one in the Lord. The, uh, one of the distribution hymns during the communion was a new one called In This Holy, Blessed Communion. And the tune for that hymn was used by Steven Spielberg in a movie called Empire of the Sun. That's pretty cool. It's not your typical stodgy Wells way. The essay <clears throat> is a tradition, it's a major think talk. And uh, Pastor Jonathan Hine of the uh, unit that uh, Pastor Jim Beringer and Pastor Eric Recker are from, the Congregational Services Unit, had the essay this year. He talked about a wells that is in transition and some of his remarks were very sobering. In the last five years, the Wells has lost 24,000 souls. We're ebbing. We're getting older and we're not replacing our older members as fast as we might. During that time, we presently have 1,270 congregations. But if some of these trends go unabated, we don't know where we will be in the next 20 to 40 years. Infant baptisms have slowed down, but the birth rate has slowed down, and so it figures. Other denominations in Christianity are facing similar challenges, some of them even more than we. But presently, in the United States, every week, 96 Christian congregations close, a few of them wells. In 1940, 80 years ago, 5% of the American population said they had no religious affiliation. Nowadays, it is 25%. There are so many shifts in society, some of which account for this. There is a, a breakdown in the traditional family structure. There is erosion of trust in churches and in Christianity in particular. And there is a great technological shift so many people are now consuming content when and if they will. On demand, if I get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I want to see all of the episodes of a TV show, second year, second season, I can call them up, and if I've got 13 hours, I can watch all 26 episodes. <clears throat> Most of our churches don't have that kind of flexibility. We still come together at specific times and specific places. Who do we blame for all of these shifts? Well, we could go on about how society has changed but sometimes the finger has to point back at us. Some of the things that Pastor Hine noted is that 
in our congregations, there is sometimes apathy. Sometimes there's a level of comfort with the status quo. Sometimes there is excessive parochialism. Sometimes, and this hits kind of close to home, there is a mindset of building structures over fulfilling mission. Sometimes there is just simple resignation. We need to think carefully about how we as a synod and we as congregations are about to meet the challenge that we face. We have many spiritual blessings as our congregations. We have word and sacrament. And try as you may, Twitter and Facebook will never deliver the, whole, the Lord's Supper to you, nor will you be baptized by all of the social media. We have the ability to connect person to person with people, to welcome the stranger, to have a faithful theological presence, and to proclaim always the theology of the cross. Our great hope for the future comes from Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, where God's word is not going to return to him empty, but will accomplish what he desires, the purpose for which he set it. Set it. The purpose, <laughs> I'll say this whole one. God's word will not return to him empty, but will accomplish what God desires, the purpose for which he sent it. We can claim this as we go forward. One of the uh, most exciting things for me and for so many in the church today is the initiative in Vietnam. Who would have known that an online sermon that someone in Asia heard in 2011 would result in a training session for 60 Hmong men who were hungry to hear about the gospel and how it could be spread in their country. And then there was the unprecedented invitation by the communist government in Vietnam to the wells to build a theological training center, a residential theological training center in Hanoi, a place that we bombed. There is such steady growth among the Hmong fellowship that I see it as God's purpose for our lives. Eight years ago, there were 55,000 members. Then there were 70,000. Then there were 100,000. And now, close to 120,000. And that's among a Hmong population indigenous of about 2 million people. I was struck by the story about the Hmong farmer who wanted to be part of this group of 60 who would be trained. But the budget was only for 60 people and everybody was spoken for. He announced to his family that they would sell the water buffalo. That's like selling your John Deere diesel tractor, your livelihood. But he was so hungry to be trained in the gospel that he did that with that kind of zeal and that kind of work by God the Holy Spirit. I want to get behind this and do what I can to help raise the remaining funds so that this ministry can get off the ground. We need to prayerfully consider what we can do. This is God's work. Let me it's ask a, you a it, question. Yeah, it's an example. Yeah. Uh, you, you told me that you have a personal connection to this, right? Tell me about that. For 14 months, 
I was in the United States Air Force and in the Vietnam War. I had 19 aerial combat missions. I was aboard the bombers that were producing these great big craters in the Vietnam countryside. Like a lot of troops, I came back from that war physically in one piece, but I was carrying the baggage of participating in that war. Now it's 50 years later, and this initiative has been a source of personal healing for me as I rejoice in what God is doing through the wells in this place. Can I ask, um, in what way is it healing for you? For me, we are able to refashion the weapons of war into plowshares and share the gospel and into pruning hooks which we will use to prune away idolatry and misinformation in favor of God's powerful word. The Hmong people were our allies in that war and because of that they tend to be persecuted if they're still back in the Vietnam area. And some of them have emigrated, of course, to this country. But I thought, wow, one of the, uh, this is an important quote, so I'll just read it. Yeah. Pastor Ham, who is the chairman of the Hmong Fellowship, writes, I don't have anything to send my Wells brothers and sisters in the U.S. to even begin to show our gratitude or appreciation. All we can send is our empty words of thank you. We trust that the training will continue to equip leaders so that the gospel will spread to many more throughout Vietnam. Pray for us. Pray for our religious freedom in this country, especially for the Hmong in the rural areas. Pray that the many minority people will have the opportunity to hear the gospel and believe it. During the first morning of the convention, we saw a magnificent mission initiative with the presentation of the flags of the 63 nations that Wells has active gospel participation in. This was presented by the Lutheran Women's Missionary League, and with each flag they gave a brief narration of the status and origin of that particular country's work. Of course, we have about 41 missionaries worldwide. Three of them were in attendance at New Ulm. But the fact of the matter is, we had the great joy of welcoming two new church bodies into our Evangelical Lutheran Fellowship. One of them is on the island nation of Taiwan. It's the uh, Lutheran Evangelical Church, the Christian Lutheran Evangelical Church, a relatively small group which has one pastor, one pastor in training, and four congregations. They came about as a result of mission work by the Wells that started in 1979. The other group that we welcomed is the Lutheran Confessional Church in the African country of Kenya. And we were excited to hear Pastor Mark Onunda speak. That body has 25 pastors that serve 46 congregations. As chairman of the group, Pastor Anunda gets around as the passenger on a motorcycle on dirt roads that in many cases are no wider than a footpath. And believe me, the bike he's on is no Harley. 
the, the visual image that's fixed in my mind for the Kenyan church is a picture of one of its structures. It looked exactly like a brush pile, sticks and twigs piled about six feet high. And as I looked a little more carefully, I could see there was an entrance and it wasn't a pile. It was a place where the Lord's gospel is proclaimed and that people give thanks and are filled with joy to hear it. And I thought to myself as I sat in a large air-conditioned hall, what lengths people go to to receive the gospel. The Synod Convention is sort of like a fire hydrant, wide open. You get so much information so fast I know at the end of a couple of those days, my head was spinning because of the scope of the work of the Synod. Pastor Mark Schrader was reelected as uh, the president. He will be serving another four years. He has always a challenging task and a very, very dedicated and capable staff. And of course, the 12 district presidents help him immeasurably in the administration of the work down to the local level. But there are so many parts. Christian Aid and Relief, Northwestern Publishing House, our flagship organization, which has provided so much reliable Christian writing and information, both for the professionals and the lay people, the ministerial education people, two preparatory schools, one college, and one seminary, all with a common goal in mind, the world and home missions, the administration, the financial services, the technical services, personnel, it goes on and on many moving parts, one goal, doing what Christ commanded in his great commission. Our challenge is to move some of this information from our brains to our hearts, because only then will we begin to reflect the love that Christ wants us to. As, as I uh, had the opportunity to explore the campus a little on my own and also take a tour, I couldn't help think about what it was like in 1884 when eight young men came to New Ulm to go to college. Back then, tuition was $32 a year. That amounts to about 80 cents per instruc instructional week. It was a residential school and there wasn't much leaving on the weekends. So in order to have seven meals provided by the college, you had to come up with a dollar and 50 cents a week for those 21 meals. But if you wanted a little bit of warmth in the room where you slept, you had to cut and bring your own firewood. And if you wanted to study in the evening, you had to either bring your own candles or kerosene. Well, things have changed, obviously. But I couldn't help think about the middle 1930s when my parents were there. They met there. My mother was in the high school division and my father was in the college division. They sang in the choir together and, of course, got to know each other. My dad had the opportunity to play basketball and football at New Ulm. That was a big deal. He was the son of a, a grocer in western Minnesota. 
And my mother was the daughter of a preacher in eastern Minnesota. And I'm so glad they came together at New Ulm or I wouldn't be sitting here. In 1932, my uncle, Waldemar Nolte, was a student <clears throat> at Dr. Martin Luther College. And he was thinking about school spirit, and his classmates were thinking about school spirit. And so pretty soon, he and one of his classmates were voted as the college's first cheerleaders. The only problem is they forgot to tell the president of the college, Professor Edmund Bleifernecht. Well, he gave him a little lecture and then he gave him his blessing. And so we have that history as well. I've got cousins who were there, other ancestors. Thirty years after Uncle Waldemar became a cheerleader, he and his wife received calls to the music faculty at the college, and they retired from there. It's quite a legacy. Very nice. I talked with one of the current faculty members at MLC by the name of Schwartz. Now, you know, Schwartz is a pretty good German Lutheran name, but this Schwartz is a woman, and her first name is Ting Ting. She was born in a country in Asia, and while she was growing up there, a young man from Wisconsin came over to participate in a program where he could teach English as a second language to the students in the high schools and colleges there. Well, Ting Ting met Dan, and, she, and they got married at New Alm. And my wife Carol and I have an Asian-born godson who was a student at New Alm at the time of their wedding. Ting Ting had a huge contingent of her family come from Asia for the wedding, and she asked our godson to read scripture at their service in Mandarin. Because she's there, today Nuam students can take a language ma major in Mandarin. There's three levels of courses including an immersion, which includes a trip to Asia for further study. Another way that our people are being trained for a world that is still emerging with its hunger for the gospel. The relationship between the Synod and its individual congregations is intended to be mutual, and it usually is. We, uh, our supply of pastors and teachers and early childhood education directors and staff ministers and school principals would start drying up if we didn't have the strong educational program that the Wells invests in. Congregation services helps us in our struggles as well. We're uh, welcoming people home who are perhaps on the inactive list with tools and training from the wells. We are growing in discipleship because of the same and because of the Northwestern Publishing House we are kept current on so many important matters, including the publication of Forward in Christ, the monthly magazine. 